I don't know if you know this, but if you're a student and aching for some money, freelancing as a music journalist is a reasonably sweet deal, especially if you focus on concerts. The workload is manageable, you see a lot of bands you wouldn't otherwise, and even though the payment isn't too great, it's alright for what you're doing, plus you usually get some pretty good seats for concerts. You need a bit of luck to get into it, but if you manage to do so, I can only recommend you give it a shot. Back when I did it, I wrote for a small magazine, which had a focus on the alternative sides of music. Given my musical taste, I was mostly panelled to attend gothic and heavy metal shows, which honestly were a lot of fun. Those are, of course, all the Marilyn Manson and Metallica knockoffs, but a lot of experimentation is going on, even though few of them actually got anywhere. I covered everything, from cover bands to experimental stuff that never made it big. I mostly saw them when they were well known enough to be worth writing about, but still kind of underground. Some of the bands got quite far actually, and one of the bands I wrote about you probably know, if you're into metal. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Back then, they sucked, let me tell you. Other bands were far more interesting. Sometimes, there's experimental bands. The kind of band that defies the traditional lineup. Maybe uses three guitars or two drums. Maybe doesn't have a singer, or decides to skip the bass guitar in favour of a taiko drum. Yes, that happened. They can be hit or miss, really. And most of it depends on the execution and dedication of the band in question. And then, there's the really weird stuff. Bands who don't just defy tradition, but outright crush every notion you have about music. These never make it big, but they make for a good article, and you can always one-up those hipster friends of yours. Whenever someone claims to have seen something, quote, like I've never even thought about, I usually tell them about the one time I saw a band that made music using old tape recorders and rubber bands or had lyrics written in a language that they invented themselves and instead of CDs, sold booklets about how to learn said language. I never tell them about Gunpo though, and I never will. That band haunts me. This was shortly before I intended to quit this job anyway since my final exams were coming up, and I wouldn't have the time or the need to work on the side. But still, I had some concerts I had promised to attend, and while I knew I should start studying for my exams, a bit of fun couldn't hurt, I reasoned. I had made a habit about researching the bands I would cover next, so that I'd know what to expect. After all, if I expected somber music to peacefully fantasize to, and got thrash metal that inspired mosh pits, that would tarnish my reviews. Also, I'd have to dress the part. Ever tried getting into a gothic club dressed in metal attire? You get in, but some of the looks you get could kill small animals. But I digress. The odd thing was, nothing really turned up for Gunpo. Their logo looked like the archetypical black metal shtick, barely readable, and that's the way they wanted it, obviously. They played in a small club not far from where I lived that was known to host some of the more hardcore bands and regularly had people roughing each other up. But that was it. No set list, no albums. Even those underground sites I usually used for reference when all else failed were sparse with information. Well, no matter. They probably had their first real gig and knew the owner or something all the better to milk it for a bit of extra cash if they turned out to be decent. A true diamond in the rough. So I went in my usual hardcore metal outfit to the club. Inside the club, the usual crowd had gathered. Metalheads of every colour, from the large, bulky types to lanky and acne-ridden. Long hair was prevalent, of course, as was the smell of beer, whiskey and questionable hygiene. Not many women in sight, and those few who were seemed to have a full flock of bodyguards. I went and got myself a beer to hide myself up while I inspected the stage. 
Gumpo was set to play in about half an hour, so I had plenty of time to observe the lineup. Nothing too special though. A set of drums, the drum bass showing the same indecipherable lettering that had come up during my research, two guitar stands, one microphone, everything hooked up and ready to go. From the way the guitar stands and the microphone were arranged, I figured they'd have a bass guitarist, a guitarist, and a singer who focused on singing, not playing the guitar on the side. Already an important observation to make beforehand, since this would make him able to engage more with the crowd. Always a good thing to have. I asked around, but the more I did, the more I understood. Nobody in here knew the band. Sure, some had done a bit of research like me, but they had found about as much or less. They were curious, however, or just didn't care about the band that was about to play. This reassured me about my theory that Gumpo probably knew the owner of the bar or someone close to them and was using this location to test the waters. Not the worst move. If they wanted a tough crowd, they'd certainly find it here. This location was known to attract a certain breed of metalhead, the kind that isn't opposed to a mosh pit going a little out of hand, if you know what I mean. Lost in thought about this, I only realized that the lights had dimmed as someone pushed me aside to get a better glimpse at the stage. The background music had ceased as well. All I could hear was excited muttering and scrambling. The first thing I noticed when the band entered the stage was the singer. He had to be the singer, really, because every other position would not suit him. He outshone the other band members up to the point that I cannot even remember them too vividly, as I was captured by him. The drummer, I remember, was of Indian descent, but otherwise, I remember little. The singer was huge. Face to face, he would have towered me in my 6'1 frame, but on stage, he looked even bigger than that. He was very heavily built too, with a prominent belly and round face. His skin was almost the colour of soot and had a look about it that I can only describe as coarse. He didn't seem to sweat, his skin as dry as a dune, but... The thing that really set him apart was his smile. When he got up to the microphone, he smiled at the crowd like he wanted to swallow them up and his teeth seemed like those of a shark, fit for the job of devouring an entire crowd to fill that enormous belly. The band had already taken their positions, but the usual hollers and cheers did not start. You could have heard a fly buzzing Nobody even daring to move, like the first one to capture the attention of the mighty singer would be the first to quench his hunger. But then, the music started. And man, when I mean it started, it really started. There was no warm up, no lame ass introduction, no one, two, three, four, accompanied by the smacking of drumsticks. They simply started their first song, and it began with a deep, guttural howl that I cannot compare to any other singer out there, for that would be unfair to them. You can train your voice all you want, but you'll never come near the sound of an earthquake. Gumpa's lead singer, however, did, and I could feel the ground rumble under my feet as he drew out his growl that the band carried with their instruments into a fast-paced composition that instantly turned the crowd from awestruck to whipped into a frenzy, a mosh pit erupting well before the second verse. I never did write that article on Gumpa, but if I had, it would have read something like this. Even after only two songs, Gunpo already had the audience where other bands take a whole evening to get them. They are going wild, dripping with sweat, and shoving each other around whatever room they have. Nobody is staying still. 
everything moves to their rhythm. Gunpa is pure, exemplified brutality, and I say this with the utmost respect. Few people can convey emotion through music, but Gunpa can. And what they convey is dominant, absolute rage. When the second song faded, the crowd was exhausted. They had gone at it like I had only seen a few times before or since, shoving, punching and kicking like they were on a battlefield. Someone had a bloody nose, but no one paid attention to it, not even the guy himself. The song faded out with a last cymbal crash and the crowd exploded in cheers and shouting. Just then, the singer raised his hand. Thank you all for coming. His voice was deep, slow, but I think everyone in the room could hear him as clearly as if he was standing right beside them. We are Gunpo, your band for this evening. You may address me as Dukkha, and we are here to cleanse the world of what we perceive is evil. Again, the crowd was almost silent. This was the usual black metal stuff I was used to hearing by now. We are the messiahs of metal, blah blah blah. It works if you're really into the band, but otherwise... Well, a few months later... It always just sounds pathetic, even if you were really into it. A show act, nothing more. But the way Ducker said it still sounded real to me. He didn't say it for show, nor did he want to make himself understood. He just said what was important to the band, as matter-of-factly as if he was reading the wiring for their setup. And we will start with all of you. You will be given the gift of absolution by violence. Kick-ass title, I thought, but I did not laugh. Nobody did. Nobody even rolled their eyes. They looked at Ducker like he was the demagogue, speaking on behalf of something they would never understand, but that he could make them serve. Well, I had been right about one thing. Absolved by violence was a kick-ass title. It was slower than the two that had came before it, but the raw energy it exuded filled the air like pheromones. The mosh pit became almost fanatical, and now there wasn't just one guy with a bloody nose, but several. People stopped helping each other up. They didn't just use their shoulders anymore with their foreheads, hands and elbows. I managed to dodge a particularly large guy who tried to shove me into the crush barrier which could have easily gone wrong. Just when I got my balance back, I found myself opposite the wall. A wall made of humans, interlocked and ready to go. I took a step back and bumped into another wall two walls of people, slowly withdrawing from one another, leaving me stranded in between them like Moses when he parted the Red Sea. I knew a wall of death when I see one, and as absolution by violence grew slower and slower still, so too did the withdrawal of those two people walls. I felt naked, exposed, like a tree just before a lightning bolt hits it. The sudden crash of the drums and the yawping of the guitar hit me just seconds before the wall did. I was crushed like an insect between two avalanches of skin, muscle and anger. People descended on one another like barbarians, sheer anger in their eyes. All the while, Gumpa was still playing, louder and angrier than ever. Someone next to me fell and disappeared under the plethora of boots. I don't know what happened to them, and I pray to God they're alive. But I honestly don't think so. Somewhere, a guy screamed in what was obviously excruciating pain. 
but he was quickly drowned by the music, his cries silenced under another verse. I don't know what made me, of all people, keep a sober mind, but I somehow managed to get through the horde of people lashing at each other like mad and out of the club. I never went back there. From what I know, the club closed shortly after, and I would never mention its name again. Gunpo has disappeared from the scene too, for all I know, if they even existed in the first place. Maybe this was all just a bad dream, accumulated from exam-induced stress. But I can still feel where those masses ran into me. Even though it has been years. <laughs>